Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland and this is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. If you'd like to support this free service, you can go to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland. The link's on my website. Uh, so, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, also on my website, there's a page in the dot in the menu and you can listen to the four main podcasts that I have, advert free and continuous. So that you press play on the first one and it will continuously play each one without adverts. This podcast on there, Deep Sleep Whisper Hypnosis, Let Me Boy to Sleep and Weekly Hip Sleep Hypnosis or Sleep Hypnosis Weekly. I think it's called, yeah. I should kind of know what my podcasts are called, but great Andre's popped out to do a wee and now he's gone back to sleep which is nice he's gone back to sleep so part of me wants to have a big moan <laughs> just a big rant and a big moan and just complain so <laughs> so I'm not going to but it made it just got me thinking um, in this particular time uh, I'm not going to ignore the situation that's going on at the moment uh, this recording's the 31st of March 2020 where the whole world is kind of going on lockdown because of the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic or whatever you want to call it so, since I last made a recording, I've actually found myself in a couple of situations where I've really uh, not lost my temper, but been very less than patient, should I maybe, yeah, less than patient. And the more this is going on, the more this stuff, it's, it has started to get to me. And maybe this recording could be useful for people that also feel in a similar way and might be useful to realise that you're not the only ones that are feeling this way. And maybe also to not feel guilty for feeling this way. So <laughs> I've noticed I've been annoyed at things that perhaps I wouldn't normally be annoyed at. And I fell down the stairs yesterday or the day before. Only the bottom two steps, you know, I kind of missed the step and I had Andre underneath my jacket uh, he's my boy he's my son he's a ferret but he's you know I had him under my jacket and I fell down landed on my knee and then ended up on my back because uh, I basically missed my foot in but I did fall down didn't hit my head or anything bashed my arm and I, think I hurt my chest a bit and you know and my knees the reason I'm talking about this is because I want to tell someone about it and I'm looking for sympathy. Also, I started thinking, well, what would I do if this was serious? This was a serious situation and I'd injured myself. I figured if I'd broken my arm or if it was fairly... Yeah, something that needed medical attention 
but not like life and death situation, then I'd get a taxi to the hospital. Then what if I didn't have enough money to get a taxi? It's kind of an impossible walk. It's got to be at least three hours walk. It's a long, 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 long way. It's not impossible, it's doable, but to do that in like good physical health would be a task, but to do it with a broken arm would be, I don't know if I'd, you know, I don't know if I'd physically be able to do it. Anyway, the point, where the reason I'm mentioning this is there's the whole thing about, uh, there's the guilt trip that's been put onto the public about not using the NHS unless it's a, like a severe emergency, telling people that actually even in an emergency you possibly won't get seen because priority goes to coronavirus patients and, uh, you know, it's there's the fear there's something that I don't know how to maybe express it nicely but it's almost like the TV news people are really enjoying creating and extending and increasing the fear in people and I don't think they realise perhaps firstly how it's affecting the average person that's you know generally physically and mentally okay and also how is it affecting someone that's dealing with anxiety or you know some other mental health issue to have this bombardment is it's hard it's hard and I suppose that's what I wanted to talk about I'm not necessarily going to give a solution I don't have an antidote for the pandemic that's the solution. I suppose another solution would be to stop watching the news as much. However, we can't really stop watching the news altogether. Otherwise, we won't know what the latest rules are as far as social distancing and when are we allowed to go out? How much are we allowed to buy? You know, those kind of things. So someone that never reads the newspapers or never watches the news, they might be just wandering around like they normally do, completely unaware of what's going on. Especially if they're solitary and they don't like speak to anyone. I can't imagine a situation. It seems like quite an unrealistic situation that someone would not know what's going on, but. You know, I've had little experiments in the past where I've not watched the news for two weeks. I don't read newspapers anyway. I get my news from the internet. So I didn't look at the internet, none of the news. Didn't go on Facebook, Twitter, just for two weeks. And people would be saying to me, no, and after two weeks I watched the news and someone would be talking, someone would be talking about something that happened like 10 days ago. Oh, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the plane crash. What plane crash? What the huge plane crash that happened? It was in all. It was like constant on the news for about six days. All they were talking about. No, didn't hear about it. Part of me felt a little bit, maybe a little bit embarrassed. You know. But then I thought, you know what? I've just managed managed to avoid and sidetrack or jump over that little hurdle or underneath it. 
all of that stuff all of that and it is negative it's, it might be factual but it's not positive is it it's it's not always something that we need to hear about either it doesn't mean it's not as valid but I don't, I don't want to know everything that's happening in every single country and with the internet we can kind of find out but sometimes I do want to know everything that's happening in every country so it's ooh, you know what am I doing so how to deal with what's going on and this may well be a complete duplication of a previous recording I've done and if that's the case I do apologise um, I will repeat myself at times anyway but I don't necessarily remember what I've said in previous recordings uh, that's why I put a title now on the recording so I kind of have an inkling I think the last recording was titled This is Temporary or something like that Remember, This is Temporary So I was in a shop the other day and the lady I was doing my best to socially keep at a distance and the woman on the counter serving me was rude to me twice once about standing on a spot when I would have been too close to the people behind me and I said no I need to I'm keeping in the middle between the two people I said if you're going to moan moan at him because he was too close to me and then she moaned that I was buying too much water so I had six bottles of water I had already mentioned it to one of her staff members the shop was practically empty and they had loads of stock coming in and most people stopped going to shops because they've been warned not to go out unless it's a kind of have to and she started having a go at me for that there's a limit of two bottles I said okay put it, I'll put the other four back you know I wasn't that bothered I only went in there because I'd forgot I'd left something in there from the day before my prescriptions that I got and they didn't have any water the day before so that's why I got it and then she was all huffy no you take it then but just next time and I said to her, you were very moany today. You know, and I kind of, I was trying not to be rude. But I wanted to be rude. And the thing is, in my heart, I've actually got a lot of time for people who work in retail. I know it's a hard job when it's busy. It can be a really boring job when it's quiet. And at Christmas, you know, times like that, it's absolute nightmare. And the last few weeks has got to have been like Christmas Eve every single day, non-stop. So it must have been horrible for people working in retail. But at the same time, I won't be moaned at. So I left the shop and I felt guilty. I was annoyed, but I was also guilty because on the part I'm thinking she's quite a kind of heroes in a way. They're doing something that most of us wouldn't want to do at this time. And probably majority of people wouldn't want to do at all due to the low wages or because they wouldn't want to do that kind of job maybe. But I have done that kind of job. And I know that it can be difficult. So kind of, you know, it's that part of me thinking, oh, you know, I got a lot of respect for people that are working in shops, 
people that are delivering stuff in lorries, people, especially those that have to have face-to-face -face contact with the public, one after another, hundreds and thousands of people maybe in a day. They shouldn't really have to go through that. I know we all have to eat and stuff, but it almost doesn't seem fair. To me, it's, it's like you should get extra staff in if you can and have them on the till for maybe an hour each and then the rest of the day doing something else. But, you know, I don't run the business, so I can't have that kind of control. But I've worked in retail when they did used to do that. Never on the till for more than an hour at Christmas time. Because it's too much. It's too much. So that kind of kicks in, so I'm feeling guilty, but I'm also angry. Very weird kind of mixture of emotions. Because I wasn't rude, I wasn't swearing, I wasn't shouting, I wasn't name calling, but probably my tone of voice wasn't so great. Um, I pulled her up on what she said. I got a colleague over and said, "What well, didn't you say it was okay for me to get these waters? Yes, fine. I explained to her why I wasn't standing on the spot, which was on the ground, saying I'm not standing here because that man is probably about two foot away from me. And then I felt guilty towards the man afterwards because he was not elderly, but he was probably in his 60s. And I started thinking, oh, I must look like a proper arsehole right now. And I don't want to. But all these people queuing are really close to each other. And she was aiming it at me. So that, that I can't have that. It's just, it's this part, of, my brain doesn't allow it. I don't mind if I'm wrong, if I've done something. Oh, I still don't like being moaned out even if I'm wrong. So that, that was a weird situation. And I've just, I don't, I'm a solitary person. I spend most of my time at home. I'm up all night, I make recordings maybe watch some TV, movies or whatever, work on my website, listen to the radio. But my night time, that's when I work. I know it's not paid work, but you know, that's when I do my, do my thing. Daytime I sleep. I don't go out very often. I might take Andre out for a walk once a day. Maybe go to the garage couple of times a week although I try to avoid the garage because I don't like it and try and make sure I've got enough food in for the week so I don't have to sort of keep going out so I don't necessarily want to go <laughs> to go out but being told that I can't go out or that I can only go out for an emergency or for uh, to buy essential foods or to go to the pharmacy or to go and to exercise just once a day. It bugs me. I'm, I'm being honest. It's not that I don't care about the reason for it. I understand the reason for it. In fact, if I was in charge, the I would be stricter. That's where the, the weirdness comes in, is I would be way stricter than the way it is now. But I'm not in charge, and I don't like people telling me what to do. And now that I'm not allowed to go out whenever I want, all I want to do is go out. The weather's getting nice, a bit cold tonight, but during the day it's bright, it's springtime. Yeah, I took Andre for a long walk the other day. 
I think it was Sunday, but I was it was the first time out all weekend. And so that was fine, but I want to take him out and he wants to go out and I want to just be able to do what I want. And I know that that's what everyone wants to do. It's not unique to me. But I don't normally want to do <laughs> I don't normally want to do that. And my germ issue, I've always had a germ issue for as long as I remember. You know, I'd never drink out of the same bottle or same can as someone else. I just ugh, disgusted me, the idea of it, generally. Uh, or share a toothbrush, which is kind of weird considering the person I was sharing a toothbrush with kind of shouldn't have really been bothered about sharing a toothbrush with them considering but still it just feels gross when I get home from being on the bus always wash my hands because I'm thinking I've been holding on to the bus handle you know just there's people there that probably haven't washed their hands and stuff generally I feel that way If someone's coughing or sneezing or sniffing, I try and, you know, I keep away from them. I don't want to be any near anyone that's ill. That's my normal state of uh, being. So now it's... It's increased, but it hasn't. It's increased in a level of my not wanting to be around people. The concern of getting ill... But from the other angle is, logically, I know that I'm not around anybody and there's less chance of catching anything when people aren't going out. So when I go to the garage and I touch the door going in, there's way less people touching that door handle than there would normally be. When I get on the bus and touch the, sit down and touch the, you know, the seat cover or the push the button on the buzzer with my knuckle, because I never do it with my fingertip anyway. There might have been no one that's touched that all day because the buses are basically empty most of the time now where I live. So I have that, it's just... But then other emotions are coming in. I'm starting to get angry with other people who aren't following the rules. You know, I know people that are still visiting each other, going in each other's houses, still walking around, going to different places, visiting parents, stuff like that. And it really winds me up. It really does. And I keep it in because I'm in no position to tell anyone else what to do. And if I was in a position to have someone to visit, so if I lived here and my parents lived... I don't know, two two blocks away or five minute walk. I'm not supposed to go there and see them. But would that stop me, realistically? Especially if I thought, you know, the chance of getting some big inheritance. So, no, I'm joking. But I, I possibly would. I don't know but it annoys me when other people do things even sometimes in these situations even when I might do it myself so there's this real conflict going on at the moment getting angry at myself for the things I'm thinking about other people and 
even the prof- the experts don't seem to know what they're talking about half the time. They just one says one thing, another says another thing, and they're saying the the and this 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 gets me. I follow the stats, and again shouldn't do it because it's not helpful, but sometimes maybe being informed is better than not being informed maybe you know I'm not an expert I'm not a doctor I'm not uh, a physicist or whatever that's needed to find an antidote for these uh, diseases but the stats are very simple to work out and an expert on this said, oh, 1% of people that have caught it have died. So only got a 1% mortality. And I'm thinking, okay, first of all, that's not true. Straight away, it's not true. Because everybody that's no longer got it, out of those people, 19% are dead. So the people that have no longer got it are those that have recovered and those that haven't recovered. 19% haven't recovered out of the ones where the cases are closed. You know, that's the ones that don't have it anymore. Out of the ones that do still have it, if you look at how many people have passed away and those people that have still got it, yeah, it's, it's a much lower percentage but the real stats you look at how many people have not got it anymore which is those people that have recovered and those people didn't recover 19% didn't recover out of the ones that have closed those closed cases I'm not saying that as like do me do me do me do me but do, do, <laughs> like all kind of negative but factual and it's it's a scary fact but it also it makes you think well, why do they on one side try and scare the hell out of everyone continuously on the news and practically every single program that seems to be on telly it's all it is they're talking about Yet when it comes to the actual statistics, they don't tell the truth. And I know that the the website I go on, which gives us statistics of every single country um, who reveal, you know, of course not every country is going to reveal the truth, but every country that reveals their, their statistics of those who have got it, how many people have got it today, how many people have been tested, how many people have recovered, how many people are seriously ill, how many people have passed away. They've got those stats for every single country. And then they've got the overall stats. So for me, I'm looking at and thinking, well, I've got the truth here and all the other stats they're given every time they say the amount I look at the website it's exactly the same amount of people for each country they talk about USA uh, Canada France Italy um, Germany UK of course Australia so they talk about the countries and it's always exactly the same stats but not the overall 19% and that's I wonder why because I'm I've never been maths maths was my my worst subject of all I was even worse at maths than I was at speaking French and I know like two words in French my ex-girlfriend used to say to me she used to keep she used to sit and laugh like oh, what now it's three un it's a three words un petit pini un ha 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 un petit pini so I never really knew what she was talking about but Mathematics wasn't my thing, but even I can see that that's the actual statics, statics, 
statistics. And then someone else said to me today, what will be will be, if I get it, I get it. No, that's not how the world works. Yeah, it, the world is random. Of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a random life that we live, that we live in certain aspects. But I'm never going to get hit by a train if I stay in my flat for the rest of my life. If I never go near a railway track, I'm never going to get hit by a train. Regardless of whether, you know, what will be, will be. You know, it's supposed to happen. All, all that stuff. All those cliches. So... I find that a little bit scary when someone almost doesn't care. They're just giving up any kind of control over their own life. Oh, if it happens, it happens. Never mind. Well, yeah, actually, I care about you and I don't want you to catch it and get ill or worse. So, yeah, so it does matter. So that that's that's annoyed me. Some of the blaseness, the arrogance, maybe of or the non-caring or complete cavalier attitude that some people I've met or talked to have, have given. Like, ah, oh, doesn't matter. I'm all right. Ain't gonna happen to me. I've had worse. You know, just the kind of complete non I don't know I mean I think there's something to be said for being well there's a huge amount to be said for being positive and let's face it if we're positive our immune system's stronger so for those that are unfortunate to catch an illness the immune system will be stronger and they're more likely to recover quicker if they're a positive person and their outlook is positive on a daily basis. So the more positive someone is, the more likely they will have a stronger immune system. Um, but it's not always the case. I know someone that's a very, very positive person, but he's got lupus. His immune system is practically non-existent. But he's a happier person because he's positive. But right now, he'll have to keep away from everybody. So if he was positive, what will be, will be. And, you know, he just carries on normal and perhaps visits people, friends. He's putting himself in a serious, serious risk. And he'd have to be pretty much really dumb to do that. So being positive isn't, the cure for everything but it's a hell of a lot better than being like, negative all the time and I, I realise this recording might come across as negative it's supposed to come across as honest and maybe you have a similar kind of feelings and going back to the falling down the stairs bit I started to feel guilty even though I didn't call for an ambulance or ask for help or go to the accident and emergency ward of the hospital I felt guilty the idea of doing it because other people you know the nurses are so overworked anyway doctors, nurses, the cleaners the receptionists people working in the canteens, you know, every single job in the hospitals are busy. They're very busy people. At the moment, it's on a different level. I keep hearing. And, and they're not being looked after. So that, that's got me that's really annoyed me. That's kind of upset me emotionally. 
the fact that they're not being looked after. I've, I've had a few friends that have been nurses. And I don't particularly like them, to be fair, but I just... <laughs> They're important, and they're not. They should be tested. So that's me. I can't go on on one. Like, why are they not being tested? They have to be tested. It's not an if. It's a has to be. They should be the first people being tested. If you're a carer, the first person you look after is yourself. If you're a firefighter, the first person you look for you look after is yourself. You have to make sure that you're safe. Otherwise, you can't help other people. So there'd be no point in me being a lifeguard because I can't swim. Or not very well. So if I jumped into a river, fully clothed, to save someone that's fallen into a river, I'm of no use to them. Really. I mean, first of all, I'm not putting myself first because I'm very likely to drown. Secondly, I'm likely to try and hold on to them so that I don't drown and probably pull them down with me. So nurses need to take care of themselves first so that they can continue to work, but they're not getting the equipment, they're not getting the, you know, the tests anyway. That's one side of it. So there's the compassionate, like the hero side. But then the other side kicks in. Why do we keep being put on a guilt trip about hospitals, the NHS in England, we have an NHS, you might have the same thing, similar things in other countries. For years, there's been a guilt trip on the general public for wasting resources, for bed blocking. Can you believe such a title as bed blocking? Which basically means someone that's unwell is using up a bed in a hospital, which I'm pretty sure that's what the hospital beds were kind of created for. That was the idea. And to start calling someone that's poorly, unwell, maybe elderly, or whatever reason they're there, to call someone like that a bed blocker is, I think, is disgusting. And to start putting the guilt on the general public constantly, they've for, year, for years have been putting in the newspapers on the telly, how people are time wasters going in with a sore throat or with a a bruise or, you know, things like that. Which is going to happen. But it's going to be rare. It's not going to be a regular thing where, you know, 70% of the people in there are just in there because they've got a hangnail or maybe they've, uh, you know, stumped their toe you know, most any time I've ever been in a hospital, people are clearly there for a reason. They're in pain. They might outwardly be bleeding, you know, from a head wound or not being able to walk or being sick or crying. You know, people don't go to the hospital for fun because it's not an enjoyable experience, generally. Some people might enjoy it, but I think most people listen to this, and most people in the world, I'm guessing, if you sort of, what would you like to do tonight, the first thing you said wouldn't be, why don't we go to the emergency ward and sit there for four hours and wait to be seen and be around loads of people that are ill? Yeah, that sounds like fun. No. No. But the public's been, I don't know, this, this guilt trip. And I felt it uh, a while back. I woke up and I was having trouble breathing. And the whole of my throat was swollen. 
and I knocked on my neighbour's door and said, Ugh. I could hardly talk. I didn't know what to do. And basically, he, we got a taxi to the hospital. He came with me. The night before, I'd seen on the news that I was moaning that people were going into A&E with a sore throat. I had a sore throat. And I didn't know what to do. I left it for a couple of hours before I went downstairs. I was trying to breathe, but it was causing anxiety. So I was kind of mid-anxiety attack at the same time because of the, you know, struggle of uh, breathing and I suppose hyperventilating maybe. And then went to the hospital, felt guilty, felt like a fraud, felt like I was wasting the hospital's time. And I see the doctor, and I said to the doctor, I feel bad. I I like to tell people how I'm feeling um, with those kinds of situations, Um, because I like to see what they've got to say. I said, I feel guilty because it's constantly in the news about people coming in for things that there's uh, little things that aren't really important and I didn't think I should come in because it's my throat and it's a sore throat and he said well, no you're having trouble breathing you needed to come in he said it's good that you came in I said okay so I felt okay after that I felt better and you know, this throat thing lasted a few days, but I was going in and out of anxiety. And I don't know if it was part of anxiety that caused it. But, so these conflicting thoughts that are coming up a bit more recently with this coronavirus thing. Guilt, you know, <laughs> for, for using the NH, uh, NHS services Guilt for even going to the shops to buy food. Um, And I understand why all of these things have been put in place. And, you know, I get it. I understand it. I don't like the feeling of guilt. I lived in a children's home run by nuns, Catholic nuns. I lived with Catholic nuns for a couple of years. Not a big fan of guilt. I'm quite happy to leave that stuff behind. Guilt is not useful. So someone, you know, to have someone to put that guilt onto the general public feels... It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel nice. And I'm making a note of places that I'm not going to be using after this happens. Like Iceland. Probably not going to be using that shop again. The one where the lady was rude to me. I might continue just for the foreseeable every couple of weeks, maybe get a bit. But after that, yeah, I'm probably not going to be using them. Not that it's going to make a huge difference to the uh, the profits. So there's all these different emotions, and I guess this is a bit different from some of the other recordings I've made. And you know, I'm not giving any solutions. Just talking about feelings, and I suppose it's okay to have these feelings. There's no rules, is there? There's no rules that says you can't have feelings. And, you know, on one side, I'm kind of got a lot of compassion for the NHS. And on the other side, I feel that I'm guilted to not use the NHS. That, you know, I shouldn't waste the NHS, the hospital, National Health Service's time. And 
it goes further with me because I start thinking about other people that aren't as I'm not going to use the word forceful as I am but as um, I take action in times like that like my neighbour downstairs mum was down outside the her daughter was on the floor couldn't get to the door to answer the floor to answer the floor couldn't get to the door to answer to open the door for her mum who was outside she collapsed and she was unwell I said to her mum call an ambulance no no it's okay I better not because she's seen the same thing that I've seen don't you don't mess you don't waste the NHS's time you don't waste the ambulance's time now I agree you don't waste the ambulance's time but it doesn't mean you should never call an ambulance or never call for the police or for fire service you don't wait until your whole house burned down and think or maybe I should have called the fire department you know it's in the end I had to say to this lady call an ambulance no no I'm going to wait her sister will be in a little while we'll do it then call an ambulance and in the end after about 10 minutes of me saying call an ambulance she did and then the ambulance said there might be 40 minutes so she didn't say to them that it was serious so I called the police I came upstairs to call the police so there's a lady downstairs she might be having a heart attack we don't know can't get into the flat because it's locked from the inside can you come and get into there get help get into the flat the police said no what do you want us to do about it however I think because they took details I think the police probably contacted the ambulance again and said this like chased it up because they were here within about yeah seven minutes and then she had a heart attack in the ambulance and she did die actually so it's not a nice ending to the story she died a few days later that was an emergency yeah I've, I've and I guess I might be wrong but I believe that her mum had that guilt that whole you don't contact in a, an ambulance service you don't call for an ambulance and, or paramedic you know unless it's an emergency what is an emergency you know what one person's emergency may not seem like another person's emergency but someone on the floor unable to move inside their flat or apartment not being able to even get to the front door that's an emergency isn't it what else could it be what possible else could it be um and it really was seriously well as serious as you get really I guess <sighs> um, so that bugs me because there's a whole the NHS the heroes they're wonderful beautiful wonderful and I, I agree but on the other, the other side I'm kind of angry at them a little bit not at the nurses but at the way that the public, including myself, are guilted. Like, you know, we are heroes, but remember that. But try not to bother us, because we're busy. And it's not the nurses or the doctors saying that. It's whoever runs the whole thing that put the adverts or the politicians or you know whoever and to come up with a term like bed blocking for an elderly person with maybe Alzheimer's dementia it just truly disgusts me 
and gets my goats, it does. So I have this mixture of compassion and anger going on and fear. And it's not, it's not doing much for my anxiety levels. Um, but what I did notice today, I didn't watch very much news. I did watch the news, but I didn't watch it as much as I normally do. And I've been working on my garden shed that's in my bedroom, which is my recording, st- it will be my recording studio. So hopefully I'll be able to do more like quieter stuff. I spent about six hours doing that today or yesterday uh, evening and I felt better for it because I was focused on something completely different I even feel more energised now at 3.53 in the morning than how I would normally feel and the weird thing about it is I didn't spend loads of time in bed I was actively doing something and that might be something that may be useful for you as well so can you please come around and help me with my shed and soundproof it if you bring your own soundproof and that would be nice I've got a little ladder <laughs> and a little I've got a tiny little hammer it's ridiculous it's almost like I'm when they sent me my toolkit They must have thought I was a watchmaker or a watch repairer. Everything's little, little hammer. I mean, honestly, when I'm holding it, I feel like I'm a giant. My dad was an electrician. He had hammers, and they were always big things, heavy things. This one's little old. It's ridiculous. Anyway, something else I'm angry about. So maybe there's something that you can focus on, something you can do new. Like I've got a friend, he's doing some painting, he's a tattoo artist, so he's starting to get more into that again, starting to do more creative things, and it's, it's focusing, he's you know, focusing on that. So maybe it's an opportunity to do something new. I'm thinking maybe I'll read a few books, do a bit of reading, put a bit more into the old brain to see if something else can come out, something useful, <laughs> but decipherable. So I realise this might sound like just one big long moan, but maybe there's someone you can talk to and tell them how you're feeling so that you can feel a bit more relaxed and kind of offload it what you could do this is just an idea it's a pretty good idea though even I do say so myself and I did just say it do you know the idea of writing a letter writing a letter to someone you're never going to send it or keeping a journal. This is something a bit different because not everybody's got someone to talk to. I kind of don't, kind of do, you know, people tend to want to sort of tell me their problems sometimes and it's, you know, it's like, okay, I don't always want to be a counsellor to people. However, there's something you can do. If you've got a mobile phone, a smartphone, which means you've got a recorder on that phone. Here's what you do. You just record yourself and you talk into it. (laughs) I'm not gonna tell you how to talk into a recorder, but you just talk, talk into the recorder for as long as you want to. And my idea is maybe instead of sitting down doing it, maybe walk. 
not pacing like an angry lion, but maybe walk around, get some exercise, get the body moving. You might just want to sit down. But maybe change your physiology so that you're not in sort of one set frame of mind. Because when you're walking, when you're moving, constantly your physiology is changing because you're physically changing your spine is being manipulated it's moving constantly your hips your lower back your brain is kind of (laughs) moving from side to side a bit i guess and when you're talking you're also using both sides of your brain because you're talking but you're also listening there's a creativity and if you're walking using both sides of your brain left right you know don't know why I mentioned left and right, but you're using both sides, which means that stimulation is happening. Anxiety is also reducing because when you use both sides of your brain, the anxiety reduces. That's why if someone is ambidextrous, to be able to write with both hands and I mean, suppose technically you could probably write at the same time, wouldn't can you? I don't know. But someone's going to write down a letter, write it handwriting, do the first line with the right hand, second line with the left hand, third line with the right hand, fourth with the left hand, right, left, right, left. Evens the brain out. Evens the emotions out. So yeah, that's it. So that's just something you could do. You you haven't got to listen to it afterwards. But you could. You could store them if you wanted. It's up to you. You're, You're in charge of what you do. Yeah, part unless of course you want to go out. (laughs) You know, go into a public place with a group of friends, and of course you can't do that, but you know, generally. Um, you're in charge if you want to listen back to it if you want to delete it whatever you want to do and you might think well why do I need to press record why don't I just talk out loud it it feels different it does it feels different I don't know why don't care why It feels different because I've done both. I've talked out loud and then I've recorded. I've done thousands of recordings. It feels different recording it. Even, it does feel different if no one's ever going to listen to it. So if no one was ever going to listen to this, I'd probably be swearing. I might even start shouting. You know, I might really get into the emotions. Probably won't shout. I'm not really a shouter, but you know, I might, yeah, I might be very um, aggressive possibly. But knowing that people are going to be listening to it means that I try and keep it a little bit neater, a little bit tidier, a little bit to the point. Although that is an argument, <laughs> it can be argued how often I actually keep things to the point. But the idea is to try and be useful. That's why I do this, but that's not why you need to. You don't need to do anything, but if you do a recording, talking about how you feel, as I said, maybe using a bit of movement as well. And if you're if you're in a chair, you maybe you can't move around. But you can still move your upper body, hopefully. If you can't move your upper body, then Maybe you can move your neck. Maybe you can move your tongue to the right side then to the left side. Maybe you can open and close your right eye and then your left eye, which will activate each side of the body, uh, the, the brain rather. So it's lots of different ways to do this. And even if if there's a speech issue and it 
if there's no one around, it doesn't matter what you sound like. And also maybe that could increase your confidence because you can talk out loud. So I know if I, you know, I've had a couple of teeth removed in my life and that feeling of, um, you know, afterwards, the mouth feels like it's about 20 times bigger. Lips like falling on the floor, but it's not really. But not being able to talk or like properly talk. Now, some people would have maybe um, an issue where they don't talk. Maybe because of dental issues or jaw issues, facial issues, whatever. Maybe they don't like their voice, whatever it is. Or perhaps they can't talk so well due to illness or the way that's maybe they're just the way they were born. But if there's no one around and talking doesn't cause suffering, doesn't hurt you, doesn't you know, doesn't cause discomfort or anything, then you could record yourself. But you don't have to listen to it, you can just delete it afterwards. But the more you do it, the chances are the more you let go, the more you get to find out actually what you do think. You realise that, yeah, you might be angry about something, but you've also got compassion. You can be angry about, or upset, or frustrated about a service that you get, but at the same time, really appreciate the service. I mean, it sounds like it's a huge conflict, but it can can happen. You know, you can l love the train service that you have and know that it's really good, it's really on time. And if you've got a train service that's regular and on time, then you need to let the world know because I've never known one. But <laughs> you can still perhaps not like how crowded it is because the tubes on you know on the underground in London they're pretty good as far as regularity but they are so busy not at the moment but you know, up to about a few days ago they were just jam-packed so you can feel, like, feel grateful that you've got a tube you can just you know walk maybe walk 10 minutes to the tube station and get to the other side of London and just you know and the train, the tubes every maybe four minutes or three minutes. However, you might not enjoy standing up for the whole journey. So, you know, we can have these conflicts. Especially in times like this. So being angry and frustrated doesn't mean we don't care. I think that's something I'm trying to remind myself. I do care, but I'm also frustrated with what's going on. I've got fear and I'm scared and I get angry sometimes, as I do in general life. But it doesn't mean I don't care about the people that maybe I'm getting angry at, like the lady in the supermarket, her being rude and moany to me. I hated her at the time, but you know, afterwards, I'm also respect what she's doing because it's a hard job, and she really shouldn't have to do it. I mean, she should have a mask or something. I don't mean that rudely. Nothing wrong with how she looks. I mean, with the, um, you know. The, the masky mask things that people are wearing. What was his name? The one out of Batman. Not not Batman, but the other one. Um, that like... Like that. I thought about getting myself a Darth Vader costume. Walking around, but... People might think I'm taking the piss. I don't know. Or I could dress as a nurse... Or as a surgeon, I could walk around dressed as a surgeon. I've got to have those in the fancy dress part shops. 
Mind you, the shops will be closed because they're not urgent, are they? Damn. Anyway, that's me. <laughs> that's me. I'm probably going to do a very relaxing recording. Very relaxing recording tomorrow. So, um, I thought it just might be useful to talk about stuff, you know, anger versus compassion, <laughs> maybe. So take care of yourselves, remember, remember, remember to be kind to yourself, especially at the moment. Do something nice for yourself today and I will speak to you probably tomorrow actually. I'm going to try and do a relaxation session in my recording studio, if it works, if it's quiet enough. So lots of love.